Brothers and sisters in Islam, every human being, especially every Muslim, should have high ambitions and lofty aspirations. What does that mean? A lot of celebrated Muslim scholars have told us that high aspirations and lofty ambitions means al kabirul himma huwa man yataharra al fadail la li jahin wa la li mansib wa la li tharwat wa la li ladha bal yataharra masalih al ibad shakiran bi dhalika ni'mat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa mutawakhiyan mardatih being ambitious means to be a virtuous person, to conform to moral excellence, not because you want to please people, not because you want a position, not because you are after wealth, or not because you want to enjoy the delights of this ephemeral life, but because you want to serve the interests of humanity, especially mankind and Muslims, and because you want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a means of being grateful to Allah for the blessings that he has given you. So you use any position that you have, you use your wealth to serve humanity as a means of showing your gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say, إِذَا كَانَتِ النُّفُوسُ كِبَارَ تَعِبَتْ فِي مُرَادِهَا الْأَجْسَامُ if your ambitions are very high, if your aspirations are very high, very lofty, you will tire your body to achieve those ambitions and you will not complain to anyone. Al-Hasan al-Basri rahimahullah was asked, how did he become successful in renouncing the pleasures of this world? How come he didn't care about the pleasures of the world and whenever he got blessings, he would share them with other human beings? He said, علمت أن رزقي لن يأخذه غيري فطم أن قلبي. I understood very well that no one will take my sustenance, which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has predetermined for me. So my heart was tranquil, my heart became calm. So whatever Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has predetermined for you as sustenance, you will get it before you die. So he didn't care about that because he knew what he was supposed to do was to work hard as a means of worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him to get the sustenance he will get it then he said I knew certainly that my work will not be done by anyone else no one can pray on your behalf no one can fast on your behalf no one can perform Hajj on your behalf if you're still alive so it's your responsibility to do your work. Don't say someone else is not doing his job, I won't do my job. Someone else is not helping Muslims, I will not help them. So someone else is not doing that, I'll not do it. Al-Hasan al-Basri says, your work will not be done by anyone else, so you have to do it alone, and you shouldn't complain about that. وَعَلِمْتُ أَنَّ اللَّهَ مُطَّلِعٌ عَلَيَّ فَاسْتَحْيَيْتُ أَنْ يَرَانِ عَلَى مَعْصِيَا I knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was watching over me so I became shy to commit sins so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would see me committing sins. In other words, Al-Hasan al-Basri felt ashamed if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw him committing sins. How many times do we abstain from committing sins because so and so is watching over us because people are looking at us but we don't put into consideration that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching over us wheresoever we may be. So if you feel shy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we need if you are in a secluded area, you should not commit sins because he is watching over you. وَعَلِمْتُ أَنَّ الْمَوْتَ قَادِمٌ فَأَعْدَدْتُ الْعِدَّ لِمُلَاقَاتِ رَبِّي I knew very well that death will come, so I prepared myself to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why Hassan al-Hassan al-Basri did not care about the pleasures of this world and if he got any blessing he would share it with other people. Al-Imam al-Munawi says Kibar al-Himma huwa adam al-mubalati bi sa'adati dunya wa shaqawatiha If you have high aspirations whether you get pleasures in this world or whether you suffer from tribulations you will not care about that because your goal is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know that ultimately you will meet with Allah 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whatever problems you get, you focus on yourself. Did you commit a sin? Did you wrong anyone? If you didn't do any sin, if you didn't wrong anyone, then you know for a certain that this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this trial and tribulation brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it as much as you become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you develop the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters in Islam, there are five aspects in which we have to aspire for the best. Uh, high aspirations are manifested in these five aspects. The first one is to seek knowledge. You have to seek knowledge because it's a commandment in Islam that every Muslim has to seek knowledge. At least the basic knowledge to know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the main aim to seek, how to, to seek knowledge is to know how to best serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to know how to get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this knowledge should reform your personality if you are a knowledgeable person and you still commit sins and this knowledge does not change the way you deal with people the way you relate with other human beings your no your knowledge doesn't have any benefit if your knowledge does not benefit your community especially the muslim ummah your knowledge doesn't have any value so seeking knowledge is one of the ways that we ha that will bring us closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the second one, al-ibadah, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wal istiqama. The worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should bring you integrity and should be with sincerity. You worship him because you want to please him, not because you want to please other human beings. Wal bahthu anil haqq, you should always look for the truth. If someone tells you that you have to do this and that, and if it is a controversial issue, so look for the truth so that you best serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fourth one, a da'wah ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inviting people to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We Muslims are torch bearers, so our work is, transit, is, uh, is transitory. In other words, when we do good deeds, we don't confine them to ourselves. We ask, uh, we, uh, we want other people as well to get rewards from what we are doing. So if we've been led to Islam by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have to look for effective means to do da'wah to other people so that they should also worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is our responsibility the, the last one is al-jihad so today I will be talking about seeking knowledge because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know for certainly that there is no one worthy to be worshipped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So any act of worship that we, you do without knowledge will, will not be accepted. You cannot, for example, pray instead of pray, praying five obligatory prayers and said to pray six or seven because you don't have knowledge. So you have to have the knowledge of prayer. If you want to perform hajj, you have to learn how to perform hajj. If you want to fast, you have to learn how to fast. So if you want to do any act of worship in a proper way, you have to get knowledge about how to do it. If you do it without knowledge, it might not be accepted of you because you will have done it in a wrong way. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says man ahadatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa min falaw fa huwa rad if anyone does an act of worship innovating something which is not in our religion doing something that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam never did doing something that the companions never did and he claims that it's part and parcel of religion it will be rejected so in order to get your acts of worship to be accepted by allah you have to have knowledge on how to perform them Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, one of the bona fide companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he's the one who first received Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when the Prophet immigrated from Mecca to Medina. At the beginning, the Prophet lived on the ground floor and Abu Ayyub was living on the first floor. But Abu Ayyub thought to himself, why should I live in a higher place than Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most beloved human being to Allah? So Abu Ayyub suggested to the Prophet that he, Abu Ayyub and his family would live on the ground floor and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would live on the first floor. So Abu Ayyub in no way wanted to be higher than Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in whatever situation it was. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari had a great love for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was committed to Islam. 
and he's among the companions that were keen to learn from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam not because they wanted to brag about the knowledge not because they wanted to become superior but because they wanted to oblige to the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and because they wanted to please Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they wanted to show their loyalty to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam even after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam died because they want they loved him they cherished his companionship when he was still alive they were keen to learn about him it's when you have a grandfather or a father you trust him uh, you cherish his knowledge he passes away then you would be keen to learn or to review his statements or his guidance that he gave you as a means of loyalty to that person so the companions of the prophet for so many reasons they were keen to seek knowledge and the best of those reasons was that they could transmit this knowledge to us so abu ayyub al ansari wanted to learn only one hadith from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the hall of the city of medina he did not find anyone who had the knowledge of that hadith saying of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he traveled all the way from medina to egypt to uqba ibn amir who understood and memorized that particular hadith at that time people traveling in caravans from mecca to syria it would take them a month going and a month coming back i'm not sure how long it took them from medina to egypt but it could be more or, or this, more or less the same uh, the same distance or the same uh, period of time so after abu ayyub al ansari arrives in medina he did not release his camel he was still holding the bridles of his camel before getting dressed he looked for abu for uqba ibn amir after learning the hadith from uqba ibn amir before getting any rest he decided to go back to medina what was his motive for doing that did he want to be praised did he want to brag about other people no he wanted to go and share the hadith with other people he wanted this hadith to transform him to change his behavior he wanted to please allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nowadays we are spoon fed by knowledge on internet newspapers islamic websites uh, lectures you name it we uh, sometimes it uh, they announce to us there will be a lecture about this and that topic we don't go for one reason or the other sometimes because the presenter is younger than us we feel that because we've been muslims for so long time we have nothing to learn from that person sometimes because of some other ulterior issues we don't have any excuse if someone travels all the way from medina to egypt on his camel seeking only to know one hadith what excuse do you have today seeking uh, sitting under an ac with computer with everything they invite you to attend a lecture for only 30 minutes and you don't go compare yourself with those bona fide companions of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam brothers and sisters in islam abdullah ibn abbas cousin of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and one of the most prominent interpreters of the quran has this to say he says that he used to hear that a certain scholar knew one hadith about prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam which he himself didn't know about so he would seek that person he would go to his house and if this person was napping was having siesta abdullah ibn abbas would spread his mantle in front of the house of that person until he woke up abdullah ibn abbas says that but sometimes wind would blow dust on his head but this wouldn't deter him from waiting for that person to learn from him only one hadith so that person would wake up open the door and surprisingly see abdullah ibn abbas covered in dust and he would ask him ya ibn ammi rasulillah ma jaa bika ila huna oh cousin of the prophet what brought you here afala arsalta ilayya fa'atik why didn't you call me so that i come to your house instead of you coming to to my house abdullah ibn abbas would say ana ahaqqu an atik i'm the one who has to come to you not you come to me because i seek knowledge from you so this is also a sign of respect for knowledgeable people from abdullah ibn abbas so if abdullah ibn abbas cousin of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam from the family of the noble prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam goes to a common person just because this person knows a hadith which he doesn't know and spreads his mantle in front of the house of this person and the wind blows dust on him if he bears all that trouble what about me and you why can't we do that